Bibles, open up to the book of Mark this morning. Mark chapter 9. <laughs>
worse than what they had thought from the, from the sky. The wind was coming over the ridge and was whipping the fire a lot faster than he had thought. Second, the swirling winds were blowing the fire above the gulch up onto the ridge. This meant that their escape route was now cut off from them. Third, as he directed his men to retreat, he discovered that the fire was in a transitional zone. Most forest fires can travel only about four or five miles per hour, which makes it easy for the men to outrun it if necessary. But Man Gulch was part of a transition zone, meaning that it was an area of the mountain that makes a transition between the forest and the plains. So the shoulder-high prairie grass is mixed in with the trees. The grass was dense and dry and ready to explode in a withering blaze. The fire was pursuing, pursuing the men along with Wagner Dodge and his team. <coughs> they were trapped in this grass with fire totally surrounding them. Dodge knew he could not outrun the wave of flame that had surrounded them. In, in just a minute, and at the most two, he estimated that they were about to be burned to death. The roar of the flames was deafening. Sap and trees was superheating and exploding. Smoke, embers, and ashes swirled around in all directions. The apparent options offered to Dodge offered no escape. They could stand and be fatally burned. They could turn and be fatally burned or run and be totally burned and die. Dodge and his 15 men were about to die. Suddenly, Wagner stopped and took a match from his shoulder pocket, lit it and threw it into the shoulder high grass in front of him. His men, watching from behind, thought he had lost his mind. There was no time to light a backfire. But Wagner Dodge was not fight lighting a backfire. He was lighting a fire that in an instant the grass was ablaze in a wet, widening circle. As the ring of fire spread, it cleared a small area of all the flammable substances. It was not much of a safety zone, but it would do. He jumped across the blazing ring, moved to its smoldering center. He wrapped a wet cloth around his face and pressed his face into the ground and waited. As he had anticipated, the surging fire wall rounded both sides of the circle. It leapt over the top but found nothing to ignite. Within moments, the front passed and he raised, and had raced up the ridge and left him unscathed in his tiny asylum. He stood. He brushed off the ash and found he was no worse for the wear. He literally had burned a hole in the fire. Thirteen of his men had decided to run that day and they died burned to death. Two of his men barreled in a rock slide heavily nearby and they managed to survive with severe burns. But Wagner Dodge survived because he had burned a hole in the fire. This morning in the text in Mark chapter 9 there was a miracle. The descriptive words that are used in this text they paint a picture. The words are descriptive. We read that this boy had a dumb spirit. That spirit, it said, it terrified him. It says that he foamed and he gnashed his teeth and he pined away and the spirit tore at him. It says that he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. It says oftentimes that that spirit threw him into the fire and then into water to destroy him. Straightway the father would cry out and he said with tears, talking to Jesus. Jesus, though, he rebuked the foul spirit. It says that the spirit cried out and it rent him sore, it says, came out of him. When that old evil spirit came out of the boy, the boy was left on the ground as if he was dead to the point that some people said he's dead. He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And the boy was whole. What we 
need today as we celebrate and observe Father's Day is men that will burn a hole in the fire. Men that will sit there when there's no other escape for their family but will stand and do the right thing. This man came to Jesus. His son was being destroyed. And as we look around us today, we see young men and young ladies, children, youth, that are being destroyed because the devil has them surrounded. The world is telling them, you do this and you do that, and this is the way things are. There's new rules. This is how you date. These are the activities you participate in. This is how you live. This is what you do. We need daddies. We need fathers that will stand in the middle of that raging storm, burn a hole right in the middle of the fire, and let God's hand cover them. Say, men that will stand. What we need to know about our kids and our grandchildren is that the devil longs to destroy them. This young man was attacked at a very young age. It's important that fathers remember that we need to work and do good and have our children led to Jesus at the earliest possible age. We need to be an example for them. I know the fires of all this stuff, the pressures of the world's all around you, expectations of people are dictating, this is the way you live, that's old fashioned, you don't do this anymore. But let me tell you what, God is still a miracle working God. God still takes tumors out of bodies, He still heals eyes, He still raises people up. He's still a miracle working God. Even though this world will sit down and tell you certain things. God's Word is always true. You're never going to make a mistake and an error by following God's Word. Right, you follow what God says and He'll work it out. And you go, know, well, preacher, it doesn't make any sense to take oil and put it on somebody's forehead. The Bible, though, says that if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith, and it says, and they'll recover and their sins will be forgiven. I don't know about how much it makes sense to take oil and put it on somebody's head, but I tell you what, the results are worth trying. Amen. Amen. God's Word is important. And we need people that will stand on God's Word instead of opinions and the way the world wants to tell us to live. It's foolishness to the unsaved. I know that. The Bible tells us that. But God's Word is based on faith. And if his little children will sit there and draw a line in the dirt and play follow the leader and we act like those two lines are a little, little walk board that's a thousand feet across a gully and everything. And if you walk off of it, you're going to die. And we're pretending that game. And we walk across the two little lines and so forth. And if we can cooperate on that child game, why can't we cooperate on the mighty Word of God and do what it says? Because you see... If we fall off into the dirt, our toe comes off the lines that we're trying to follow on the ground. We might lose the game. But if we wander off of what God's Word tells us to do, the results are eternal. It's a faith thing. Now this account by Mark is troubling. Old John Mark wrote this and he said that this young man had been under the control of a demon his entire life pretty much. There was not moments of hellish terror that would uh, endure because of this demon. Physical pain from the times he had been thrashed about by this spirit because of the violence of evil that was in him. The ostracism, can you imagine how the community avoided this young child and maybe the rest of the family because of what this devil was doing inside this boy? He was a hostage in his own home because of this evil. He couldn't speak because of the strength of the evil. 
This young man would foam with the mouth and grind his teeth together in the pain. He'd stiffen up like a board on the ground. There's a phrase there in verse 22 that says, And oft times it hath cast him into the fire. Can you imagine the scars on this young boy from the fire? Oft times it said, oft times, often this demon cast this boy into the fire. The burns on his arms and his legs and maybe on the side of his face. The hair that had been taken away and scars where hair would not grow back. Disfigured this child. The father was in absolute anguish over the condition of his son. He was bringing his father to Jesus. What could this man do to help he and his son? He needed Jesus. You see, Jesus is the, is the hole you burn in the fire. Within our own strength, we can't, we can't fight this stuff. Within our own knowledge, we, we can't come up with a solution. But you see, Jesus is the hole in the fire. Thirteen men ran and died that day. When a man took a match out of his shoulder, pocket, and cast it into the grass to clear a hole. Then jumping through the flames, that small area could have taken long to burn. Take a wet rag and wrap around his face and bury his face into the dirt. While the mighty hand of God covered him and saved his life. We got to come to Jesus and let God cover us. We got to be the daddy. We got to be the men. We got to be the mamas. We got to be the ladies. We got to be the young people that are willing to sit there and say, God, you've got to do it. Oh, 13 people ran that day in Paris because they didn't do what their leader was telling them to do. You see, because it didn't make any sense. It wasn't going to be big enough. It wasn't going to be fast enough. But you see, they had no options. So many times the devil puts you in a situation where there's no other options. You can't see a way out. God's way out. God always gives a way. In some way, God always has a miracle for you. God always has some instruction for you. God always has a way out. The devil, it says, is like a roaring lion going to and fro, seeking whom he to destroy. The Bible also says that the devil sets snares to trap whoever he can. Whomever he can. The saved he's trying to trap. The unsaved he's trying to trap. He's trying to destroy us. And what you do, if God's in it, probably isn't going to make sense to all the people around you. If they don't turn to God, they, like the 13, will probably perish. We need men that will burn a hole in the fire. You see, this man was willing to seek Jesus. Men, are you willing to seek Jesus today? Men, are you willing to sit down and say, look, I can work all I can. I can be blessed with the work of my hands. But God, I need you. There's times I just need you. And stand in your hole. Jesus. Turn it over to Him. The world sits down and if you, if you make up your mind, you can do anything. You're not smart enough. You need a hole in the fire. You need a Jesus. If you make enough money, you can handle it. But when that doctor comes in the room with the wrong diagnosis, you need a hole in the fire. You need a Jesus. Your money. I have no idea what this man's occupation in Mark chapter 9 was. He could have been one of the wealthiest men in town. He could have been just a day laborer somewhere. It wasn't important. What he needed was Jesus. Any shred of pride that man had was gone.
because his son was in trouble. It wasn't difficult for him to see that his child needed this man named Jesus. The fact of the matter is, is we need to have the sense that this man had and understand that our child, our children, they need Jesus. They need to learn about Him. They need to hear about Him. They need to sing about Him. They need to be taught about Him. They need to be led to Him. They need a hole in the fire. They need Jesus. It may be the only spot in their life that they can have safety. Not only did this man seek Jesus, but he also knew that there was a predator out there to destroy his family. That same account that we read today is also over in Matthew chapter 17 and Luke uh, chapter 9 there. Later on in verse 39 it says, And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly cried out, and he teareth him, and that he foameth again, and bruising him, heartily departed from him. First, this man was willing to seek the Lord. Secondly, he knew there was a predator involved. In this world, there's a predator. Sometimes in church today, we sit in our air-conditioned buildings and, and, and our complaint is, is it's too cold or it's too hot or, or there's too many gnats lying around this morning or, or something. Instead of just being satisfied in the presence of God Almighty and focusing in on Him. I've got friends over in Kenya that are pastors and they walk several kilometers barefoot. Holes in their pants. Their best shirts stained and have holes in them. And they're going to preach. They're going to church. And their church isn't a building. And it, not even a pole shed. It's a place designated that sometimes there's a tree in a field. And there's wild animals on the sides of the roads. And these men walk down with no protection to go preach to their congregation. And talking with some of them, I go, well, how do people get to church? They walk. There's no cars. There's no bicycles. They walk. How far do they walk? Some of them 12 kilometers, they tell me. And today we sit and we fuss because, well, New Prospect's five miles outside of town. That's a long way. In our air-conditioned cars with still built radios on them on paved roads. Yeah. And these people are walking with wild animals that can consume them and destroy them on the sides of the road. I say, well, what's your church service like? Well, we get together and we sing and we clap. And some of them get up and they're dancing and having a big time. And they're raising their hands and praising God and singing hallelujahs. And they're being vocal about it. And they're praising God. And they're not ashamed of it. And, it, and it's a hundred degrees out there. And they're having a big time. And I said, well, how long does your services last? Well, we get there. We get there. We try to get started around uh, 11 or 12 o'clock. And we leave when the sun goes down. And I go, well, what about your, y'all don't go by the buffet and eat? No. They get started. They walked a number of miles and they praised God. And they listened to the Word and they praised God. And they come to the altar, which is a bare spot of dirt, and get on their face before God and get themselves right with a holy and majestic God who loves them dearly. They don't leave until the sun starts going down. And they don't eat because Sunday's the day they praise God. Preachers long winded. I wish we cut down a song. They're sitting there, their song service goes until they can't remember anything else to sing. Mm -hmm. One of the preachers said, we taught them these songs and this song and this song, and they sing it over and over and over again, and I'd love to get them another one, but they wouldn't take anything out. they just add that to it mm -hmm. and keep singing. Mm -hmm. And we got to go home when the sun goes down, the lions are out. 
just had that kind of situation. I don't know if I could make it to church. These people do. You see, they got a hole in the middle of the fire. They found Jesus. Amen. They got that safe place in the middle of everything else. We need people that will find that safe place. They know there's predators out there, but they're going to find their hole in the middle of the fire. There's a predator after us. There's a predator after our children. We need to bring our children into church. It's not up to them to decide they want to go down four-wheeling and play in the mud. It's not up to them to go to the beach. That's not their decision. Parents are ready to bring their kids into the house of God and teach them the things of God. That's right. And to be an example, which means the parents need to be at church too. Told you the story one time about a little child that was on Sunday morning and his daddy was, hurry up, you got to go to church. You got to go to church. Hey, daddy, you don't go to church. I went to church all the time when I was a little kid. And the little boy goes back to his room to get ready and sits down and says, what, didn't do him no good. Oh, my we have to be examples, too. Mm -hmm. Our standards have dropped down. We let things interfere with our hole in the middle of the fire, our safety place. We've got a bunch of statistics here. Only 19% of Americans 55 and older say pornography is morally acceptable. Almost 20% says it's okay. But 29% Almost 30% of young people, 35 to 54, say it's okay. Everybody does it. Worse than that, 42% of Americans, 18 to 34, say it's okay. Since 1960. Violent crime in the United States up 467%. 463% increase in state and federal prisons. 461% increase in out of wedlock births. A 200% increase in children living in single parent homes. The teen suicide rate has doubled since 1960. The divorce rate has doubled, and the SAT scores on our children have dropped by 60 points. Mm. The devil, there's a predator out there to destroy us. This man came to Jesus. This man knew there was a predator trying to kill his son. He was looking for a hole in the middle of the fire. He didn't care what anybody else thought. He didn't care what somebody else's opinion. His life was impacted by the devil, by that demon. So bad, he was looking for his hole in the middle of the fire. Mm -hmm. And we have to get serious enough to look for our hole. We have to be like that man. Because you see, with all the statistics that I read to you just a second ago, you need to understand that even though things are going south, things are not going right. The divorce rate's up. The single parents are going up. Our kids are going down with SAT scores. Prisons and jails are, are overflowing to the point the federal judges are sitting down saying you got to let some of them out. All these problems. You see, there's a predator out there, but I want to also let you know there's also a Savior. The father was willing to seek for Jesus, and he knew there was a predator, but he also knew that there was a remedy for his son. He recognized Jesus as that remedy. The Spirit was too strong for the disciple. Oh, but it wasn't too strong for the Lord. When the Father brought His Son to Jesus, there was something that took place. Verse 25, When Jesus saw that the people came running together, He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. Verse 27, that Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. We need to see our children arising. We need to see them rising up 
under the hand and power of Jesus Christ, under His leadership. We can't bring our children under that leadership unless we bring them to Jesus. We have to bring them to Jesus. Fathers, on this Father's Day, it's our responsibility to make sure we burn a hole in the fire. We're going to have to reach up, grab that match out of the side pocket, light it, and throw down the grass to burn a hole. A place where we can be safe, where our family can be safe. To bring your families to the Lord. To share the love for the Word with them. You've got to develop a love in yourself for the Word of God. To shelter them from the predator that roams this world that's looking to destroy them. Pray for them in the morning, at the noon hour, and in the evening, and into the night. To pray for our families, our children, our wives. We need men that will find a hole in the fire. You might say, well, preacher, everything in my household is okay. My kids are good. Everybody's safe. But on the way home, what if the predator, the old devil, comes after you? Do you have a hole? Do you have a Jesus? Have you prepared? Do you have a love for the Word of God in your heart? This morning, for the invitation, I'm going to ask anybody that needs to come down and find a hole. Mamas, daddies, young people. If you need a hole, if you need a place, Jesus is that place. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to do that. Because Jesus is the hole in the fire.